All right. Well, we're glad you all joined us tonight um, for another, now our first move to Monday night, the Monday Pastor's Bible Study. Um, let me open up our time in a word of prayer, and then I do want to talk again, once again, about the way forward, kind of where, what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. Um, and then we'll finish the lesson that we started two weeks ago, and then we'll see where we go from here. So let's, let's open up our time in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you once again that we have the privilege of gathering together. We can open up your word and we can hear from you. You interact with us when we open up your word. You teach us and you speak to us. And so, Lord, we pray as we've opened your word tonight, Lord, we, we're just calling on that promise. We can't even begin to understand your truths without your help. And so, Lord, we pray tonight as we continue this discussion of how we can be effective ambassadors for you in the workplace. Lord, we just pray that you would just bless our time. You would teach us, and as you do, would you help us to hear you and help us to understand what you have for us, help us to respond. Lord, just bless our time together tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, um, anyway, so we're going to start this, what does the Bible say about a question and answer um, series, and we do it for a couple of weeks until the regular schedule kicks kicks back off, and then we'd sort of see at that point. Um, all of the home groups, it looks like, are starting that second week in September, so the week of the 14th of September. So I thought what we would do then is we would continue this for a couple more weeks until the home groups start back up. So we'll continue this through the, the last one we'll have together like this via Zoom would be the 14th of September. And then after that, I'll just record a, a, a short devotion or short lesson or something and put that up on YouTube and share it on Facebook. Because I think all of you are going to get plugged, my discussions, all of you are going to get plugged into a home group. And so, I don't want, as I said, we said a couple weeks ago, I don't want this to become too much. Oh, I got to do that pastor's Bible study, in addition to home group, in addition to men's study, in addition to women's study. So we'll do this through the 14th. Um, now, Ruben, is he there yet? He is. Okay. So Ruben, you said two weeks ago that you had a couple other questions to add to this series. What does the Bible say about, fill in the blank, um, what were those other questions you would like us to deal with? I'm kind of putting you on the spot tonight, but you are because I can't remember yesterday. Mm -hmm. All right, well, think about it. You don't have to remember them right now, but think about it. Um, we'll and we'll circle back to that at the end, Ruben. So before we get off tonight, I would if you can remember what those are, um, shoot them my way, shoot me a message, or just bring them up at the end of the, the lesson tonight. One thing to mention, next week we will not be able to meet. I have a, an, an afternoon long Zoom meeting tomorrow or, or next Monday evening. And I got to be honest, I would rather poke my eye out with a fork than sit through an afternoon long Zoom meeting, but that's what's going on. So um, next Monday we won't meet. So we'll meet tonight. Then we'll meet the 7th and the 14th of September, and then we'll be finished for this format. Okay? Questions? Okay, so let's jump in now. We, were, we started answering the question two weeks ago. Amanda gave the question, how can we be effective, how can we effectively represent Christ in the workplace? And so we started answering that question, kind of basing my response on this book, I'm trying to get that lined up so the camera picks it up, How to Be a Christian at Work. Um, and so I'm kind of basing my answer off of that. We're in Daniel chapter one. So take out your Bible, turn to Daniel chapter one. Um, I'm not going to reteach what we covered two weeks ago, but I, we will need to review it a little bit so that we can finish the discussion tonight. This book looking at Daniel's experience. And you remember Daniel's experience there 
he he's he and three other boys, Shadrach, Meshach, Abed, and Abednego, they they are in captivity in Babylon. They are among some of the leading guys that are put in this sort of a um, Babylonian indoctrination kind of program. And the and the four boys, Daniel particularly, kind of the leader of that group, I get the impression, they say, we're not going to defile ourselves with what the king has for us, his wine and his food. And so they have this workplace situation where they have to determine, are we going to represent God and stand firm for our our godly beliefs, or are we going to give in? So it's a very relevant passage, a very relevant portion of scripture that deals with this question that we're talking about. This book gives us the acronym NICER of how to answer the question, how do I represent Christ well at work? And remember, that's not just about being nice. Nice is good. Nice is biblical even. But you remember we talked about two weeks ago that if we're just nice at work, if we are just good people, but we never bring people to the gospel, they'll start to believe that all it takes to be a Christian, all it takes to go to heaven is just to be a nice person. Nicer doesn't mean just being nice. It is an acronym. No compromise, integrity, compassion, excellence, and responsibility. So we looked two weeks ago at the N and the I, let me briefly, very briefly, recap them. Uh, first of all, questions or comments or um, anything to add at this point? Okay. I will assume by your silence that I was brilliant in my teaching two weeks ago. Um, no questions here. <laughs> Okay, so N means no compromise. You remember we look there in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, and it starts off, it says, Daniel made up his mind. Compromise or no compromise begins in our hearts and it begins in our minds. And Daniel made up his mind. He, he said, we're not going to do this. He, he made a, a commitment. I'm not going to compromise my godly principles. And you know they were they were in a in a difficult spot but but they they had to determine what are we going to do are we going to continue to live by by godly rules listen nobody would have known the difference they're in babylon nobody would have called them out on it and said hey aren't you guys jews aren't you guys supposed to be following the the levitical laws nobody would have cared but, but they made a decision that they weren't going to compromise. They weren't going to let even just a little bit in. They, they were going to stand firm. Um, you know, we sometimes face compromises in the workplace, temptations, opportunities to compromise that aren't always exactly or as dramatic as the ones that Daniel and his friends experienced. What are some of the kinds of compromises that you and I might be tempted with or faced with in the workplace? I think I said this earlier, but silence is a big one um, when you're wearing a different hat. Um, sometimes silence, you know, appears um, like you're consenting, but uh, in a pluralistic society, it's very difficult especially while you're in a different capacity. Um, silence on a matter for the Lord um, is, is difficult. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Silence can certainly be one of the ways that we're tempted to compromise. People are talking about things or sharing uh, ungodly thoughts and, and talking about ungodly things, and we just stand there silent. Don't speak up. Don't end the conversation in any way. Um, I think of one of my assignments was with a special ops unit. I was not special ops when I was active duty, but I was assigned as a personnel goon to a special ops unit. And you know, in that environment, the the language is rough, the discussions coarse, the joking is just you know atrocious, and the temptation in those kinds of environments. And this is, I think, this is true in almost every military environment. It was more so in that one. 
but it's been true in almost every military environment I, I, I served in, was the temptation is to just kind of go along to get along. You know, I'm going to compromise a little bit. I'm going to go along with the discussions. I'm going to go along with the joking or, you know, and, and, and like just I'm not going to say anything against it. I'm just going to go along. And those are some of the kinds of temptations. We don't always face the same kind that Daniel did. In fact, most of the time we won't. But we do face some temptations to compromise. I stands for integrity. And when we talked about that means just doing the right thing simply because it's right. As I mentioned, Daniel and his friends, nobody would have called them on it. Nobody would have cared. Nobody would have said anything. They could have gotten by with, with just slipping a little bit, and nobody would have called them out. But they chose to do what was right. Um, in fact, at the end of verse 8, he simply just did not want to defile himself. It didn't matter what the environment at work was. It didn't matter what other people would or would not say about it. He determined the right thing for us to do is to follow the Levitical laws, and we're going to, regardless of what the, the uh, people around us might say or do. And for him, it was, it was a regular thing. I think it was something that always happened. We'll see here and again in, in chapter 6 that that's even what his opponents noticed about him. Listen, we just can't find anything wrong with this Daniel guy. This wasn't a one-off thing. And for us, you know, we, we can't just think about, well, in a crisis situation, then I know I'll stand on my integrity. Because if we don't stand on our integrity in non-crisis situations, it's unlikely we'll stand when there's a real temptation, when there's a real issue facing us, and we have a real decision to make, it's unlikely we'll stand in those moments. And integrity is nothing more than allowing biblical principles to guide our actions, to guide our decisions. Okay, so that's what we talked about two weeks ago. Um, no compromise and in integrity. We come to the C in nicer, and that is compassion compassionate in our relationship. Look at verse 11, Daniel chapter 1. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. Daniel's response, I think, shows a great deal of compassion for the plight of this official. Remember back, back at the end of verse 10, the official said, hey, listen, if you guys don't eat what the king has given you to eat, and he notices a difference in you, well, I'm going to lose my head. So this is a bad thing. Now, Daniel didn't have to show that compassion. I think that's important for us to recognize. It wasn't Daniel's job to look out for this official. It wasn't his job to keep this guy safe. He could have just dug his heels in and said, listen, I don't care what happens to you. I will not defile myself. But, but Daniel took a different route. He stood. He didn't compromise. But he also looked for a way to show compassion, to look out for the well-being of others around him in a way that didn't require him to compromise. And I think the question for us when we're around in the workplace, we're interacting with others and we're thinking about whether I'm compassionate to them or not, is do you see others as a resource? Do you see them as a means to an end? Or do you see them as other people? People who have issues and concerns and, and challenges in their life. And yes, some of those will affect the workplace, but how do you approach them? Do you care about what's going on in their lives? And then maybe the more important question is, do they know that? I mean, you may care and think, well, I really, you know, really, that person really looks like they're troubled. I'm really concerned about it. But do they know you care? Do they know you have any compassion for what's going on in their lives? When we look at the gospel. That was the way Jesus 
responded. That was the way Jesus treated people. And, and, and for us as believers, do we see people the way Jesus saw people? I didn't assign scriptures this time. We did two weeks ago, and you, you know, I don't have the list up anymore, so I'll just read them because since I didn't assign them, just to save us time for, from flipping around to find them all. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 and 36, and this is what it says. So Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And listen, this is the last part. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I think one of the challenges for us as believers is that we don't get to the point where we start to look down our noses at, at unbelievers. Kind of get this, I'm better than you, kind of, not that we would necessarily think that, but it can come across that way, it sort of feels a little like that. We come across like, I'm better than you. The question is from Jesus, we look at Jesus's reaction. You know, can we look at folks and say, I see them unbelievers in my workplace. I see them as like sheep without a shepherd. And think about what that looks like. They're lost, they're confused. They don't even know the way and they're not even, they don't even know they're lost. And so when we see other people in the workplace, do we take a stance like Daniel and say, listen, I'm not directly responsible for that person, but I'm going to take, I'm going to make it my responsibility to, to be concerned about their well-being, show compassion for them. And then be on the lookout for the Holy Spirit's promptings. Because once we make that commitment to say, Lord, I want to see people the way you saw them. I want to see them through the lens of your compassion. We'll start to see them that way. And be on the lookout as the Spirit prompts you to say, hey, something's happening there in their life. That person really looks like they're, they're, they're weighed down or burdened. And be available to bring hope. We've talked in the service on, on Sunday, I think it was just this past Sunday, how we have to, the greatest need that people have is, is to come to Christ. The, their physical needs are important. What is going on in their life, those things are important. We can't ignore those. We shouldn't ignore those. But the greatest need they have is hope. The greatest need they have is forgiveness and to come to Christ and be available to bring hope. I read somewhere one of the simplest ways to do that. One of the simplest ways to turn almost any conversation, or, or certainly when you're interacting with someone about challenges in their life, a simple way to turn those conversations to spiritual matters is simply to ask if you can pray for them. Better yet, ask if you can pray with them and then do it. And I'll tell you, you can do that in uniform. I know that's always a question. Can we do that in a military workplace? Absolutely, you can. You're asking a question. You're not demanding, I'm going to pray with you right now. You're asking, can I? And if they say yes, you absolutely can pray with them, even in uniform, even there in the workplace. And it, and it does open doors. It does open conversations to say, do you really believe in prayer? Why do you believe in prayer? Do you really believe that God hears? And, and I tell you, that is such a simple way, and it's non-threatening. The worst they can say is, no, you can't pray for me. But whenever I, my experience has been, whenever I've asked somebody who's struggling, had a hard time, and keeping an eye, you see it. And whenever I've asked somebody, can I pray for you? Can I pray with you? I've not had one person say no. Nah, I don't want you to pray. I just want to struggle with my stuff, and I don't, I don't want to invoke any kind of prayer. I've never had one person say, no, you can't pray. I would prefer that you did. Always be available to bring hope to the situation. Peter said this, 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks, who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness 
do it with respect. Always approach people with compassion. Even when you're going to share the gospel, approach them with compassion. Don't water down the message. Don't change the gospel, but certainly be aware of your, you know, the people you're talking to and what their needs are. Questions so far? Thoughts? Input? Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, I've used that so often, um, just even, you know, not necessarily, hey, can I pray with you? But even just letting people that you know um, are, are, aren't going through things or heard about something negative, it's important to tell them, hey, I'm going to pray for you about that. You know, and uh, I've never heard anybody say don't or no, please don't. You know, it's always like, thank you very much. You know, I've had some like responses. Well, if you want to, you know, like, but, um, you know, it's never negative. Yeah. And, and that kind of investment pays dividends. Not always, but many times. In that moment, even the guy, Jeff, that said, well, if you want to, you can pray. And sometimes, you know, the Lord will use that to open up a door later on when they have something else happening in their life and they'll come to you. And, and specifically, hey, can, can you pray about this thing too? Um, and, and, and the Lord uses that op to open doors often. And I said, always be prepared to give, to bring hope. And thinking about what Peter said in 1 Peter 3, always be ready to give an answer and account for the hope that you have within you. Um, I want to talk about, just for a few minutes, a simple way to share the gospel. I think most people, when you talk about evangelism, sharing your faith, they get a little bit nervous. Um, and it's okay to admit that. They say, oh, I'm a little bit nervous about sharing my faith. And I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Um, I want to share a simple little method of sharing the gospel. You may have heard of it before. It's not something I come up with. It's called the Romans Road. And if you've heard it before, then just kind of review it in your mind as we go through it. If you've never heard of it before, write these verses down. You don't have to remember everything in the Bible and where everything is at. You just have to remember five verses. And you can bring someone through the entire gospel story and share your faith with them. You are, then are prepared and ready to give an account for the hope that is in you. So if you do have a Bible with you, turn to Romans. And we'll just look through the Romans road real quick. Starts in Romans 3, Romans 3.23. 3. I mentioned on Sunday, if you don't tell people the bad news, then the good news doesn't make any sense. They don't, they don't understand salvation if they don't understand where their starting point is, that they're sinners, that they need to be saved. Romans 3.23. 3. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. That's the place we have to begin in the gospel presentation to help people understand that they are sinners. It's not just them. It's not that because I'm a Christian, I'm perfect, and I don't ever sin. Every one of us. Romans 3.23. From there, jump over to Romans 6.23, the first part of it. This, this paints the, the rest of the bad news story. And I, I think most even people would say, even unbelievers, yeah, I'm a sinner. In fact, a lot of them would joke about it. Yeah, I'm a sinner. They'd almost be proud of it, the fact that they're sinners. Take them then to Romans 6, 23, the first part of it, the wages of sin is death. That there is a price to be paid. Sin brought death into this world. Sin brings us to an eternal state of spiritual death, separates us from God for all of eternity. There's a huge price to be paid for sin. It's not a joking or a laughing matter. And then take them back to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The reality is we're all sinners. The reality is we owe the wages of sin, which is death. And God is not waiting for us to clean our act up, to get our stuff all together, to start acting better before he'll apply his love to our lives, before he'll, he'll do anything for us. While we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. He died for us even though we were sinners. And then take them back again to Romans 6, 23, the last part of it. Though the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It's not something we can earn. It's not something that we have to work for. It's just a gift that God has purchased for us, makes available to us, and all we have to do is receive it, repent of our sins and receive it. And then take them over to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. This is how you do it. This is how you accept Christ. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not a question of saying a specific prayer. I mentioned that on Sunday when I led in the sinner's prayer. It's not a, a, a question of saying a specific prayer or I, did I say the right words or did I ask God that right? It's merely a question of confessing your sinfulness before God, confessing that you need him desperately to be saved. You believe what Jesus did. If you believe that in your heart, then he, he will save you. It's a simple way to share the gospel. But it's, but it's an effective way, and it's something you don't have to remember a ton of verses. You only have to remember five, well, four, really, one, two, three, four, no, five. You don't have to remember five, and, and you, you can bring someone through the gospel message. Okay, have any of y'all ever used that before? Is that new to you, the Romans Road? Um, I can memorize it as a teen, but I've never really used it with anyone. Okay. Jeff, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I've, I've, I've heard all about it. I've known what it is. I've, in a roundabout way, that's the gospel. You know what I mean? So like, it, it always comes out some way, but I've never actually just used the Romans road per se. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, and I had, I had a friend who used to say this all the time, you know, it's better to have one way to do something than no way. Um, this is certainly not the only way to share the gospel, but I think if we think about always being prepared to give an account for the hope that is within us, and oftentimes one of the reasons, Jeff, you mentioned being silent, that's a temptation. Oftentimes one of the reasons I think many believers are silent when there's an opportunity to share their faith is they're not prepared. They don't know how to do it. How do I get this conversation started? How do I talk to someone about the gospel? But, you know, with, with kind of these, these handful of verses in your hip pocket, you can say, if I start to stumble or I, you know, I, I'm not quite sure where to go, I can just start to move through the, these verses and I can share the gospel with them. It's not that's the only way to do it, but it is a good way to do it. When we go to Moldova, we usually, when we go to people's homes, we'll share the Romans Road with them. And we have these little cards. We use little bracelets. I don't know if you've seen them. There's their little wordless book bracelets with the different color beads on them that represent different aspects of the, of the gospel message. And we have a card that, has, that explains the colors of the beads and has these verses on it translated into Romanian. So we can just give that to them and walk them through the beads and we can share in a very simple, quick and direct way. Uh, we can share the gospel. So it's, it's an effective tool. As you and I start to be compassionate, well, not start to, but think about intentionally being compassionate in the workplace, looking for opportunities to see people the way Jesus sees them. And we're, and we're praying, Lord, will you help me to see where I can bring hope, where I can be light in this dark workplace? God will start to open your eyes. And start to reveal those things to you and be ready that that helps you um, use that tool be ready to give an account so no compromise integrity compassion the e is excellence excellence in work and whenever we talk about what it looks like being a christian in the work in the workplace this is usually where we go <clears throat> and we'll think about this one issue you know, being excellent in our work. Colossians 3, verses 22 through 24. He said, slaves in all things, obey those who are your masters, who are your masters on earth, not with external service, as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. 
whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. We talked about Daniel um, over in Daniel chapter 6, um, verse 5, I think it is. Yeah, Daniel chapter 6, verse 5. His opponents looked at his work ethic. They looked at how he conducted himself and how he worked and the things that he did. And they said, Listen, we won't find any ground of accusation against Daniel unless we find it against him with, res with regard to the law of his God. They looked at Daniel's work ethic and they simply couldn't find anything. Now, it's not that his work was perfect, but they just couldn't find anything really to point out, anything to, to, to say, hey, here's, here's something Daniel's really doing wrong. He, he was committed to excellence in the workplace. Mike, welcome aboard. We're glad you joined us tonight. We are um, answering the question, Mike, how can we be effective, um, effectively represent Christ in the workplace? And you're kind of joining uh, this, this program already in progress, um, but we're using the acronym NICER, and that stands for no compromise, integrity, compassion. We're on E, excellent in work. One of the ways we can represent Christ in the workplace, being excellent at our job. And we're looking at Daniel chapter 1. So if you've got your Bible there, Mike, take it out, turn to Daniel chapter 1. But I think what Daniel did, something that's a challenge to all of us, is to, he kept the heavenly perspective when he was in the workplace. He kept in mind a perspective that he represented his God wherever he went. And you and I as believers represent Christ everywhere we go. You may have heard people say this, that you may be the only Bible that people read. And that applies to our work ethic too. When people see your work ethic, what do they think about your Lord, knowing you're a believer? Do they think, oh, that guy's lazy? That guy's just skirting the rules all the time. He's always trying to get out of work. Or do they see a very different picture? Do they see someone who's committed? Do they see someone who's dedicated? Do they see someone who's, who's doing everything to do it right? Not just doing the right things, but doing things right. Is that what they see? Daniel very much kept a heavenly perspective. Realize when you're in that workplace, we look at what, what Paul said there in Colossians chapter 3, that it was God who gave you that job. Now, I know there, there are a lot of days when that's, that's easier to recognize than others. There are some days when the work, the job is just an absolute drag and it's a mess and there's things going on, it's difficult. And it's harder on those days to keep that perspective, but to realize that God is the one who gave you that job. That he put you in that workplace. And that we're accountable to him for how we conduct ourselves there. Accountable to him more so than we are to our boss. We're accountable to our boss, but more so to the Lord. We are his ambassadors. Just think about from a sort of a political perspective, what an ambassador is. Let me throw it out there as a question because I'm getting tired of hearing myself talk. What is an ambassador? What do they do? What is their, what is their role? Uh, well, either representative, uh, a lot of times they're, they speak for, um, uh, a lot of times they're, the, they're that communication bridge between uh, like countries. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the ambassador is the representative of their home country government. And when they speak, now the, the words that they're speaking, they're not original, right? They're speaking what they've been told to speak. They're representing their president, they're representing the Congress or whatever. They're representing their government. They're passing on the message, but they speak with the authority 
of their home country. And they very much represent it. So if you've got an ambassador, UN or something, you've got an ambassador who is a poor representative, you know, who's, who's out, you know, acting a fool, getting drunk, bring, you know, just, just generally acting terrible at the job. It's not just that person that people think bad things of. They think bad things of the country they represent. And scripture says that you and I are ambassadors of Christ. And that there's no gap between our Sunday morning self and our Monday morning self. That we sit in church on Sunday, we sing praises, and, and we say amen, and we're there thinking about what it means to be a, a, a follower of Christ. And Monday morning, we're a complete jerk in the workplace. And there's no disconnect, no separation. I remember when I was stationed at Keesler, um, I was in the, the squadron that had, had, was responsible for all of the international students. There were a lot of, in case you're not been stationed there, there were a lot of international students that came to Keesler for the particular military training. They were, they were in their, you know, their home country military, but they came to Keesler for comm training or personnel training or something. They would come to our military classes. Um, and, and so the squadron that I was in, the flight that I was the flight commander for, we, we had responsibility for these students. And I remember there was this, these guys that would come from Saudi Arabia. And the guy who was in charge of all of these students was constantly getting called to the jail to get these guys. They were getting drunk and getting in trouble and getting in fights and getting arrested on a regular basis. And as you can imagine, James, that was his name, he had the most colorful stories, but he asked one of the guys one time, he said, listen, you guys are Muslims, right? So you're not supposed to be drinking alcohol. So why is it that this is the third time this month I've bailed you out of jail for being drunk and disorderly? And the guy said, yeah, that's true. We're Muslims and we're not supposed to drink, but Allah can't see us here because we're in an infidel nation. And I think that as believers, we'd scoff at that. And we should. You know, what kind of God is it you believe in that can't see you because you're over here? Right? You know, you're in a different nation, so I can't see you. But how many times as believers, in a practical sense, do our lives act like that is true? Well, I'm at work. This is my work self. What I do at work has no bearing on who I am on Sunday or who I am in church. And for us to keep a heavenly perspective that, you know, Christians ought to be the best workers in the workplace. Because we, we wear that symbol, the representative. We are Christians everywhere we go. We represent Christ everywhere. We ought to be the best workers on time. And let me just say this is, you know, this is today's day and age on time is not always a big thing, but, um, you know, when you've got an appointment at 10 o'clock or whatever, when you're on time, you show respect to the other person. If I respect your time. I'm going to be here on time like we agreed. Christians ought to be on time, ready to work, willing to work, not a Debbie Downer in the workplace. You know, that person is always grumbling about the job. Oh, this job is terrible. I can't, I hate this job always grumbling about their boss. Christians ought, ought, oughtn't be the ones that are participating in that, certainly not leading that discussion. Humble workers, encouragers, seeking win-wins. That's what Daniel did. He sought a win-win in his workplace. That's, that's the way Christians ought to be excellence in the workplace. Comments, thoughts about that? Questions? Um, yeah, I mean, that's just uh, one of those things that completely agree, especially with the, uh, being on time and, you know, showing that shows respect to those around you as well and their time. Um, whether that's on time for a meeting or finishing on time, uh, that shows that, uh, that you respect their schedule and what they need to do as well. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and, you know, there's so many aspects of our, of our Christian principles 
that, that apply to our workplace. And if we were just to list out, you know, what are the characteristics of a Christian? You know, I think we would say we, and then we made another list and said, what are the characteristics of a good employee? You know, what do I, what do I want to see in the ideal, the model employees? I think we would find that those lists are strangely similar. That the things that Christ calls us to be and to do and the way he calls us to respond and to act are exactly what we, we would want to see in the ideal employee at work. And so it's important, but not just so we get promoted or whatever, so we you know, advance in our career. Daniel made this commitment and said, regardless of whether I advance or not, I mean, God blessed him and he did advance. We know how the story played out, but that's not why he did it. Again, thinking about integrity, he did it. He was excellent in work, excellent in everything he did, simply because it was the right thing to do, simply because he was representing his God and he knew it. And when people looked at him and they said, that guy is a Hebrew, he represents in a very real way the Hebrew God. There's an excellent work. The last one, R, is responsible. Responsible to and responsible for others. It's not just about you. You know that? In the workplace, your salvation, it's not just about you. I mean, think about our salvation. If, if our salvation was just about us, just about me spending eternity in heaven with God, that's the only reason he saved me. And if it was only about me and only about us, I believe he would have taken us home to heaven the moment he saved us. Because it would serve no purpose to leave us here. But if our salvation is not only about us, it is about us, it's just not only about us. And if that is not only about us, then you think about where we are in the workplace is not only about you either. And does that thought drive you? Does that thought ever you know, occur to us when we're in the workplace that, listen, I'm here, but it's not just about me that God has placed me here. Daniel got that. In everything that Daniel did, he strove to define God to those around him. That was his goal. That was, that was his, his intent, to define God around him, to those around him, so that they could find God. Jeannie and I taught a teach a parenting class. I don't think we taught past tense. We, we do teach it usually once a year. And that's one of the key themes of that material that as Christian parents, as Christian families, our task is to define God to the world so that the world can find God. And that's true in the workplace too. But us as believers in the workplace, that's our task. As you said, when people look at us, we may be the only Bible they ever read. We may be the only Jesus they ever see. And when they see us, you know, we have to realize that we're responsible to an extent for what kind of Jesus image do I project to them? Am I defining God to them in a, in a biblical way, in a good way? Am I defining God so that they can find him? Because the reality is we are witnesses. It doesn't matter whether we think we are or whether we intentionally are. As believers, we are witnesses. The only question is, what kind of witnesses are we going to be? Are we good witnesses or are we not? Jesus said this, Mark chapter 12, <clears throat> verses 30 and 31. He said, love the Lord your God. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second commandment is this, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. What does that mean, love your neighbor as yourself? When you hear that phrase, what does that mean?
it, it means treating other people or looking at other people in the same way that you view yourself. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we immediately take the selfish route, you know, in our, in our mind and maybe it may not follow through to our actions, but you know, in our minds are obviously our first thought naturally is self, you know? Um, and so being able to reroute that to someone else, you know, thinking of, of others and, um, putting them before us and in, in our thoughts and our actions. Yeah, that's a great answer, Amanda. And, and, you know, and just when you, when you think about the level of care and concern and responsibility that you have for yourself, you know, are you willing to do that for someone else? Would you really love your neighbor, love someone else that much? as much as you care for yourself, as much as you are concerned about yourself, as much as you are responsible for yourself, would you allow yourself to think that way about other people? And if you're a leader in the workplace, the implications of that are obvious. It's easy to see sort of the, the applications. Oh yeah, I can see how that would play out. I'm responsible for all of those people that are below me. I've got to take care of them. It's, it's your job to take care of those sheep, to take care of those under your charge. I get that, I understand that. But even if you're not a leader, and it doesn't mean you're off the hook. It doesn't mean we can say, well, I've got no responsibility here. I don't have to, I don't have to love my neighbor as myself in the workplace. I can just do whatever I want. We still are responsible, not only to others, but responsible for others. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Now, the Hebrew writer here is writing about their relationships in the church, but I think it's, there's an applicability uh, an application to the workplace, just the same. He says, obey your leaders and submit to them for their keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Obey your leaders, submit to them willingly. Allow yourself to, to you know, you are responsible to others, but then also in a certain sense, you know, let them, let them lead you with joy. Count it as your responsibility to say, I'm not going to be a burden to my boss. I'm not going to be the one they dread coming to work to deal with every day or every week. I'm going to let them do this with joy, not with groaning. First of all, that's of no advantage to me, but it's of no advantage to them, and I have a responsibility. And then 1 Timothy chapter 2 Paul said, first of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men for kings and those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Do you pray for those in your workplace? Do you pray for your boss? Do you pray for those that you have to, that you're responsible to? Do you pray for those around your workplace that you count yourself as responsible for? God put me here. I'm not in this work center by accident. He caused my paths to cross with this person. And your coworkers are not in that workplace by accident either. By divine appointment, we're all here. Now, I have a responsibility then to say, Lord, what did you put me here to do? And every day when I come into work, I have a responsibility to say, Lord, help me to, to carry that responsibility out. You've put me here for such a time as this, and I want to be faithful to that. So when we think about the acronym NICER, we think about this question of, you know, how can we represent Christ well at work? Um, I hope this acronym NICER is something that can that can help you to think about some of these things and think about as as you go about your business in the workplace. Am I being a good representative? Let me just ask a, a, a discussion question or so, just to get a little more discussion going. Was there an area of this that stood out to you? Uh, you know, something you need to focus on, something you need to do better on. What was one area of this discussion of nicer that you know, man, I'm not very good at that. I really need to work on that.
So I had a note earlier, sorry, this is not technically answering your question. Right. Um, because when you were talking about um, respect for people's time and all of that, um, showing respect in the workplace, um, I know one of the things that I've learned through the years of, of working um, is there are a lot of people who are workaholics, um, which if you're a single person and you're by yourself, then that's, you know, your schedule, your time, no big deal. Um, but I've seen a lot of people with families, especially young families that, you know, will stay at work two, three hours after multiple times a week, you know, and um, forgetting that their family is their number one ministry. Like you've always said, family's the first ministry to, to focus on, you know? Um, and so that's always been something that like, not, not necessarily that I've had to deal with, but like I've seen through like Ruben's coworkers, he's had people that, you know, will stay a lot, you know, stay after a long time. And like, I've tried to encourage him, like, encourage them to go home, you know, encourage, yes, this work is important, but your family's even more important, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, that, no, that's a great observation, Amanda. And I, and especially, I think as, you know, when you're in a leadership position in the workplace, um, you know, that, that partially begins with modeling that and, and like you say, telling them that, listen, go home, that workers will be there tomorrow. It, it's okay. It, this is not, the, you know, the, the world's not going to start, stop spinning if we don't, you know, produce these PowerPoint slides today. Um, see you later, Mike. Thanks for joining us for a little while anyway. Um, but yeah, I think it's important that as a leader, especially in the workplace, you set that standard. And when it's time to go, you go. And when it's quitting time, there's no more work to do. You're not hanging around just for the sake of hanging around. That, that really sends a message to those that are under you that they have permission to do that. It's okay. The boss goes home on time every day. It's okay for me to go home on time every day. He's not going to look down on me because, you know, because I do that because he does. I'm going to follow him out the door every day. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a great observation. Okay, for me someone personally, else. sorry, real oh, quick, to answer your question, really answer it this time. Um, <laughs> I would say, I think my biggest struggle would be um, the whole compromise area when it comes to jokes. Like, um, I'm, I'm a sucker for a good joke. And sometimes, mm -hmm. dang it, they're just funny. And so it's very hard for me sometimes when coworkers will tell a joke with foul language or, you know, it could be slightly inappropriate. Like sometimes I literally have to turn in my chair and hide my face because I want to laugh, but I know mm. I shouldn't, you know? Um, and so I think that's definitely an area that is a challenge for me, for sure. I love good humor. <laughs> okay, good. So what, what, someone else, what's, what's one area of this that stood out to you as something you need to focus on? Whoa, <laughs> someone unmuted me before I was ready to, uh, I mean, several, you know, things to kind of consider and work on. Uh, I've, one of the things to struggle is the um, whole idea of turning a, I'll pray for you, or will you pray for me into a, let's pray together. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's pray right now, like put them on the spot um, instead of just saying yes. Um, and, 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 you know, using that as an in, uh, the other, the other being kind of being responsible for others. I've always just, I kind of know it, but kind of in putting in that, this perspective of, uh, as a, as a Christian adds a different lens to that, um, whether it's being responsible or. I've always kind of talked to my folks about it being accountable, being accountable to each other mm -hmm. uh, in that um, type of conversation. Um, so yeah, those are, those are some of the things that I've been kind of thinking on. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Being responsible, being accountable, you know, it's, it's the same, the same idea and the same concept and, you know, realizing it's more than just my work responsibilities. Yes, I'm responsible. But again, I'm, I am responsible as, as the torchbearer of Christ, and I might be the only one. 
in this workplace as the torchbearer of Christ. And you know, and Ruben, you talked about how it's sometimes a challenge to um, to, to take that extra step. Can I pray with you right now? Um, you know, and and I I think if you word it that way, do you, would it be okay if I prayed with you right now? Um, because that really doesn't put them on the spot. I mean, they they have an opportunity to say no. Um, I, because I've not I've not encountered anyone who actually does. And maybe they genuinely wanted me to pray. Maybe they were just saying it to be nice. I don't know. But but I think you know when you're on the lookout and you're trying to be compassionate and you're noticing things in other people's lives, you're having that conversation with somebody who's going through something already. And so it's a natural leap for them to. I said, well, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, I really do want to pray about this. Um, and if they say no, then like Jeff said, you just say, okay, well, I, you know, no, I'm going to pray for you, you know, and, and leave it at that. But um, yeah, good. Yeah, this is an interesting little acronym, NICER, and it's something that we can remember. I think it's easy for us to, you know, to, to wrap our head around and say it's not just about being a nice guy, um, but it is about thinking very intentionally about how I am to represent Christ in the workplace. Good question, Amanda. Thank you for asking it. Okay, so Ruben, did you remember what your other questions were? Um, so we do have a question. Uh, I don't remember Ruben's questions, but I do remember that Junior got in the van Sunday after church with a question. Okay. Um, and so I think it's way too long to discuss right now, but we can go ahead and ask it if you would like. Sure, absolutely. Um, his question was, uh, where was Jesus after he died? Like, where did he go for the three days that he was dead? Mm. Yeah, I was chatting with the Stoibers after youth group, and they said that question came up. Um, they didn't mention who asked it, but they did say that question came up. Um, yeah, well, I'll give you the short answer, and then if if um, you know if if he wants to talk about it some more, if you guys want to talk about it some more, we can do that. Not tonight, but uh, maybe next time. Where I think he was after he died was he was in heaven with the Father, and the reason I think that is because what he said on the cross when he was talking to the thief that was next to him. You know, the, he, the one thief was, was getting on Jesus. The other guy said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say to that other thief? Anybody remember? I'll see you in paradise. He said, today you will be with me. Oh, you'll be in with paradise. Me. So what does that tell us about where Jesus went? today he's in paradise <laughs> he went to paradise and he went there right now yeah um and so i know there's some speculation about I mean, the scripture never really tells us those three days what happened what was going on where was he what, we're not we're not really told any of that but i think just the fact that he made that comment if he had gone anywhere else there some of the more liturgical churches lutheran church in particular um you, if you recite the apostles creed they'll say that he died he descended into hell, and on the third day, he was raised again. But then what he said to the thief on the cross was disingenuous. I mean, in what sense could hell be called paradise? And he didn't say to the thief, hey, in three days, we'll be in paradise. He said, we're going there right now. So, yeah, I think he, I think he immediately went to heaven with the Father. Paul talks about to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So I think there's no waiting room. There's no middle ground. We're here or we're there. Good question. It's a very good question. I know that's what the server said. Those teams had a lot of good questions. <laughs> Makes but, sense. Yeah, but if, if Junior wants to talk about that some more, I'm glad to do that. Um, uh, or if you guys want to talk about some more next time. But again, we won't meet next week. Um, but we will meet on the 7th of September will be the next time we'll meet. And then if you have questions between now and then, shoot them to me. And, and if you don't have one, I have a couple teed up that, that we will address one of them on the 7th. Um, but if you have one in particular that you want to talk about, shoot it to me and uh, we'll deal with that on the 7th.
All right. Well, thank you guys for joining me tonight. Thank you for being a part of this. And uh, let me pray us out and we can have a have an evening with our family. Father, thank you uh, once again. That we've had this privilege of coming together and uh, opening up your word, uh, studying it and learning about how to be more effective representatives for you in the workplace. And Father, we just pray that as, as we think about these things we talked about, this acronym NICER, Lord, would you continue to work in our hearts to help us to, to chip off the rough edges, to become more and more like you, so that when people see us in the workplace, they see you in the workplace. Father, help us to do that. Help us to be ever mindful that we are your ambassadors. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the study, for this time, and this good discussion together. Lord, we pray for your blessing on the rest of this evening, the rest of this week, this weekend as we come together to worship you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Well, thank you. Have a great night, and we will see you. Some of you maybe on Saturday for the workday, and for certain on Sunday, we'll see you at church. Sounds good. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.